Peter Gusky with the Back Saber System. I'm here today with a video and the, the idea for this video goes back quite a while, several years really. The title of it is not my own. Uh, I've taken that from some research, published research that I came across a few years ago. And it's research done primarily by one uh, neurosurgeon. And the title of that research, uh, a couple of pieces of research that this neurosurgeon did, uh, one of them, the title of it was Unnecessary Spine Surgery. And the, at the time that I came across this published research, it coincided with some experience that I was having uh, with regard to treating some patients as a physical therapist, some post-fusion patients. And now as a physical therapist with 30 years of uh, clinical experience, the patients that I was seeing, uh, there was some curiosity on my part about them to say the least because what I was seeing was four, five, six, seven, even eight or more different level spinal instrumented fusions. Now, this was radically different from what I'd seen earlier in my career, which was maybe one, two, or three different levels being fused. And there were just plain lots more spinal fusion patients that I was seeing post-spinal surgery, primarily instrumented spinal fusions that were being done. So what I'm doing here is really reporting the results of the research that I did and what I'm going to focus on really is two things. Number one, how the money from certain industries influences the you and the knowledge of this can benefit you, a patient, or maybe a loved one, or a potential patient. And the other thing that I'm going to focus on is the almost unbelievably high rates or the increase in the rates of instrumented spinal fusions that uh, we're seeing here in the last few years or if not in the last decade or a decade and a half. This is not the kind of information that you'll find laying around the waiting room of a spinal surgeon. And it's been my experience that most patients are, they're simply unaware of what is going on with regard to spinal fusions, what happens to a patient after they undergo especially instrumented spinal fusion. And hopefully this information, as I mentioned, will be useful for yourself or uh, maybe a loved one. I want to read something very briefly. I'm going to have it up here in print, but I, I feel like I need to read it also just to make sure that everybody gets this information. The information in this video is designed and intended to educate the layman and inform the layman of the results of published medical research. This information is, is not intended uh, nor implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Always seek the advice of your medical doctor prior to starting any medical treatments or with questions concerning a medical condition. Okay, um, when I perform my, what I call the back saver system, educational training sessions for industry, for employers and their employees, which I do all over the country, when I do that, I oftentimes receive questions from the attendees with regard to how somebody does after spinal fusion surgery. From a physical therapist's point of view, how do they do with regard to function and pain? And the, the, the sort of questions that you might get from somebody, possibly where they've uh, been to a physician or a spinal surgeon of some type, and possibly they've been, uh, it's been recommended that they have spinal surgery. And, they want to get some information on how patients do from a physical therapist's point of view. First, I am not a surgeon. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a licensed physical therapist. And that it does now require a doctorate level degree. But again, I'm not a medical doctor and physical therapists are not medical doctors. They don't go to medical school. They go through a, a different track. This is not meant to be a substitute for good medical advice, which can only be provided by a medical doctor. The decision to have surgery or not have surgery should always be done in conjunction with a qualified medical doctor, preferably a medical specialist, and it's usually orthopedic surgeons or neurosurgeons that specialize in spinal surgery. This is not meant to serve as a substitute for that sound medical advice by a qualified medical doctor, and this is certainly not meant to be a substitute for the good, thorough, shared decision-making and informed consent process that should always be there. Let's start at the beginning. When a spinal surgeon 
performs their surgery, they use devices. It's sometimes called instrumentation or the hardware, medical implants or metallic implants. I'll use all of those terms synonymously here as, as I go through this video. This is part of the surgery. This is the tools that the spinal surgeon uses. And these metallic implants or instrumentation or hardware is made by several different companies. I just call them Brand X and Brand Y here. And these companies that make these metallic implants or uh, instrumentation or hardware, they employ salespeople. And those salespeople compete to have surgeons use their particular brand of metallic components as opposed to another company's brand, just like any other salespeople do for any other product. But although they try to sell the spinal surgeon, so to speak, it isn't a sale in the usual sense in that the spinal surgeon doesn't pay for these metallic implants. That's paid for primarily by insurance companies or in my home state of Florida, primarily oftentimes by Medicare just because we have so many uh, retirement age folks here in the state of Florida. If you saw these metallic implants, the screws, the rods, and the plates that the neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon, spinal surgeon uses, if you held them in your hand, it would look like something that you would never pay more than a few dollars for if you picked it up at your local Home Depot. But it turns out that these metallic implants are very expensive. Uh, oftentimes, they're the single most expensive item in a surgery, and oftentimes exceeding the fee even that the, that the spinal surgeon receives him or herself. The salespeople that sell these devices make a commission on how many sales they make, like any other salesperson selling anything else or any other product. There are many different kinds of metallic components because there are many different ways to perform, especially here I'm, I'm focusing in on instrumented spinal fusion surgeries. And as I said, although the salespeople and the metallic component manufacturers try to sell the spinal surgeon on their particular device, the spinal surgeon doesn't pay for them, but he or she, the spinal surgeon, certainly selects them. The spinal surgeon decides which brand of metallic component to use, what kind to use, whether to use any at all, or even whether to perform surgery in the first place on a particular patient, as well they should. I mean, it's the spinal surgeon that has the training, the experience, they're the ones in there, they know which devices to select and which ones not to select. So they know what to do with regard to the hardware concerning a particular patient's condition. The salespeople make their living selling these components, and it's to their advantage, quite naturally, to have a particular spinal surgeon remain loyal to their particular brand. And it's to that salesperson, and of course the manufacturer of the devices, it's to their advantage to have the spinal surgeon perform as many fusions as possible, utilizing as much as possible of their product. That's what they're in business to do. But it has been alleged that the salespeople for these devices and the companies that make them have, it's been alleged that they make payments to spinal surgeons, provide them with gifts, valuable gifts, large payments in exchange for that spinal surgeon's loyalty to that salesman's or salesperson's brand of metallic device. Now, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the probably the most prestigious organization, uh, which many spinal surgeons belong to, a professional association, they don't appear to like these kind of arrangements, this money or gifts being paid to spinal surgeons or any other surgeons for that matter, and they weighed in on this. Uh, they say, look, these kind of arrangements could divert the actions of the physician away from what is best for the patient. So first and foremost, what the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is saying to its surgeon members, look, the device or hardware, the selection of the device or hardware for your surgery, that sale, that, uh, that selection, that decision on what to use should not be made 
based on which salesperson gives you the most money or provides you with the most valuable gifts. You as a spinal surgeon need to make that decision based on what is most appropriate for the patient. Clearly, certainly they would do that and appropriately so. <clears throat> You, the patient, obviously don't want the spinal surgeon making their decision on what metallic component to use in your surgery based on which salesperson gives them the most money or provides them with the most gifts. You want that decision made on what is most medically appropriate for your particular decision. The OIG and the Office of the Inspector General I kind of think of them as the police for Medicare. They've also weighed in on this. They kind of warn physicians. They say, look, such illegal arrangements, they could be illegal, the OIG says, induces physicians. It could induce physicians, spinal surgeons, to use products, these metallic components, on the basis of their loyalty to the company. Or they could be induced, these kind of arrangements, could provide inducement to the spinal surgeon, the physician, to choose the metallic components to get more money from the company rather than what is best for the patient. So the OIG, uh, kind of the police for Medicare, as I mentioned, is making the statement to spinal surgeons and others that, look, you can be induced uh, to make your uh, decision as to which components to use based on the salespeople, and we don't want you doing that. So the OIG, the... Uh, it, part of the Department of Health and Human Services, as I mentioned, kind of the enforcement or police uh, folks for Medicare, in their attempt to guard against these type of arrangements, they cite cases. Uh, they say, look, as kind of a warning here, uh, look what happened. Four orthopedic device manufacturers, the people that make these metallic components, screws, rods, and plates, for spinal surgeons, four orthopedic device manufacturers paid $311 million back to Medicare to settle allegations of kickbacks and bribery to surgeons. They, they come right out and say it. Look, this could be, in some instances, kickbacks construed as a kickback or a bribe to surgeons. How did the companies and sales folks, apparently, give kickbacks and bribes, as the OIG is saying, to surgeons? Well, <laughs> they paid them. Uh, in, the, in the shortest possible language, simply stated, they paid them. How did they pay them? Well, with vacations, gifts, annual so-called consulting fees. The quotations there are not mine, that's from the OIG's website. In other words, not real consulting fees. They were paid them up to $200,000 per orthopedic surgeon in return for that spinal surgeon, orthopedic or neurosurgeon's use of their particular products. It's not a bad addition to your average annual income as a spinal surgeon, which you'll see on the internet of anywhere from $600,000 to $750,000 a year is what I'm seeing for an average salary for a spinal surgeon. An additional $200,000, that's, that's, that's some real money here. Now, this is anything but new. It's been going on as, certainly as far back as 2003 when there was a big article in the New York Times kind of exposing this. And it showed that a document provided by one of the former employees of a company that makes the metallic components, the rods, the screws, and the plate, plates that spinal surgeons use, they had a list of about 80 surgeons who had so-called consulting agreements, I'll tell you why I say so-called, with Medtronic, Medtronic is just one of the companies that makes these, these this hardware or instrumentation that paid as much as $400,000 to, to a spinal surgeon. <clears throat> That's an awful lot of money. Now you're talking some really serious money. $400,000, this, this is an agreement, uh, as far as the article in the New York Times stated, an agreement that dated back to the late 1990s. So $400,000 in today's money, that would be closer to $600,000. We're not just talking about a salesperson. Maybe going into a spinal surgeon's office and trying to ingratiate themselves by buying lunch, lunch for the whole staff. No. This is some really big money. I mean really big money. $400,000, $600,000 a year. 
That's an awful lot of money. You can do the math on this. It's an enormous amount of money. In fact, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the professional association that many spinal surgeons belong to, and the former president has made commentary on this in an article, a subsequent article has stated, this is just an astronomical amount of money that is going out to spinal surgeons, other orthopedic and neurosurgeons. If you're a surgeon, however, they tend to sometimes take the point of view of, well, isn't it reasonable? Doesn't it seem reasonable that a spinal surgeon would consult with a metallic implant device company and be paid for it? After all, we advance technology in metallic components, in the screws and rods and plates. They become better due to consultation with the actual people that are using the devices. They're the ones that can give a manufacturer of the devices input on how to make them better, how to refine them, how to improve them. That's after all how technology in metallic components, in surgical comp uh, metallic components, improves. That's, I, I suppose, a reasonable point of view to take on the part of a spinal surgeon. But the question then becomes, if the spinal surgeon performed consulting and was paid for it, how much was he paid and what did he do? Was it truly a consulting agreement? And in that area we have an example. In one agreement that was uh, found out in this investigation, uh, the metallic component manufacturer required the spinal surgeon to consult with the company for two days every three months, a total of eight days, for which he would be paid $400,000 a year. $400,000 for eight days worth of work. Now, it's pretty easy to do the math on that. $400,000, eight days worth of work. Oh, by the way, in today's money, this goes back to the early 2000s. So in today's money, it'd be closer to $600,000, as I mentioned. We'll take either number. Take the $400,000 or the $600,000, whichever one you want to work with. Run the math, and what you're looking at for eight days is between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars paid to the spinal surgeon per day of consulting. Does anyone seriously believe that to be a real consulting agreement? Is the reason that the spinal implant, the hardware, the instrumentation manufacturer, and their salespeople paying the spinal surgeon that kind of money, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars per day for consulting? that they're paying that to that spinal surgeon in order to receive that spinal surgeon's consulting expertise, fifty dollars to $75,000 a day? Or are they paying it to him in order to get something in return, which is that spinal surgeon's loyalty to their particular brand of metallic component and quite frankly to incentivize to incentivize that spinal surgeon to use as much of their product as possible. Now, the OIG comes right out and warns physicians. They're not, I'm not asking this question whether it's a legitimate consulting agreement. The OIG is. They're saying, look, some companies have used sham consulting agreements. They're not real consulting agreements. They're there for the purpose of buying physicians' loyalty to their product, which the OIG comes right out and says, look, this could be kickbacks and bribery in some cases. Now, to guard against this kind of thing, the Academy, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, has something to say about this. They kind of warn physicians. Hardware manufacturers, drug manufacturers, others that may influence physicians, they say, look, the intent of these gifts from industry, industry is to change the behavior of physicians in favor of more increased use of their particular product. That's their intent. The, the Academy comes right out, right out and tells their spinal surgeon members, look, doctors, the people that make this stuff, they're giving you this money and these gifts because they expect to get something back from you. Namely, your loyalty, 
to their particular brand of component and they want to incentivize you to use lots and lots of it. Now, many spinal surgeons will admit, they say, yes, we receive these payments, we receive this money, but it doesn't influence them. It doesn't influence their decision making. It doesn't affect them as far as wanting to use more product. It doesn't incentivize them to do that. It doesn't maintain their loyalty to a particular brand of metallic component. It doesn't affect them. But the, the Academy, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, kind of guards against, blunts that kind of a response by saying, look, the acceptance of gifts from industry has been shown. It's been shown to change the behavior of physicians. And they cite research studies that support that gifts and payments do indeed change the behavior of physicians in favor of using certain products that the companies provided money and payments to doctors. But largely, this is not what spinal surgeons and other physicians say. Now, most of the research that's done here is with regard to the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, the drug industry on physicians, but it applies just as well to the manufacturers and salespeople of metallic components, hardware, or instrumentation for spinal instrumented fusions. However, physicians, they typically report, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, physicians typically report that they are not biased by financial arrangements. They say it, it just does not influence them. Now, in that, they, they, they fly in the face of an enormous body of evidence that shows that gift giving does influence physicians' behavior. In fact, even gifts of minimal value do so. And I think it would influence anyone. Human nature is alive and well in all of us, including spinal surgeons. Nevertheless, doctors say, no, doesn't affect them. Fascinatingly, in a study done on medical students, they report that, yes, uh, the, these payments from industry and gifts from industry, uh, it is problematic for other professions, but not for medicine. So, yes, there's a problem, but not with us. Again, they fly in the face of many psychological studies, social science research that, that says that we are all able to recognize bias and influence. We can see it in others, but not in ourselves. So how widespread is this? Uh, should I be worried about this a relationship that maybe my spinal surgeon has with industry? How much of this is going on? How, how widespread is this in the industry? Should I be concerned? Well, a fascinating study published in one of the most prestigious journals in, in the world on spinal pathology, a journal titled Spine, it looked at 6,000 spinal surgeons who performed instrumented spinal fusions and other spinal fusions on Medicare patients and the reporting data of whether they accepted gifts and how often and how much. Of the 6,000 spinal surgeons, how many of them, what percentage of them have these kind of relationships with industry where they receive gifts, money, payments? Of the 6,000, 92%, 92%, have those kinds of relationships. And the authors of this study are quick to point out that they believe the 92% is an underreported number because the 92% does not include relationships where the spinal surgeon has an ownership interest or what's called an equity, an equity interest. The spinal surgeon owns part of the company that distributes the medical devices. The 92% doesn't include that, so the authors of the study are quick to say, hey, look, we think it's actually much higher than 92%. Okay, so how much are these spinal surgeons that perform these fusions on Medicare patients, 92% of them which have a relationship with industry, where they're getting money, payments, gifts, how much are they getting? How much is industry paying them? Of the 6,000 spinal surgeons looked at, 
390 of them received over a million dollars each over a one-year period 2013 to 2014 which is what this study looked at now that's in addition to their average annual salary which i find on the internet to be in the neighborhood of 600 to 750 thousand dollars a year that's quite an addition to their income a million dollars indeed it is enormous it is astronomical as the former president of the american academy of orthopedic surgeons said you're looking at astronomical amounts of money now not all of the six thousand surgeons received a million dollars each from industry only only if you can use the word only here only close to 400 did if you averaged it out over the six thousand surgeons they received on the average thirty seven thousand dollars during that year period nevertheless almost 400 of them received over a million dollars. Fusion surgery, historically, just looking back a little bit, can be done with or without metallic components, without the screws, the rods, the plates. But in the most recent years, in the last uh, couple of decades or so, the components that they use, the screws, the rods, the plates, they've improved they're of a higher quality the technology has improved the way that they're put in has been improved computer navigation has allowed them to be placed more precisely and the argument from the spinal surgeons is that it's better to use instrumentation because you get a better fusion in a fusion after all you're trying to get two bones or three or four or five or six or whatever it is you're dealing with you're trying to get those bones to fuse together and when you use the instrumentation the rods the screws the plates it, it works better, it fuses the bones better. Now, that's good for the patient in a way because in years past, when I saw post-fusion patients, they had to wear these big braces. I mean big, it covered uh, all of their upper body, part of their hips, it was the same in the back, it was real thick plastic. For the most part, it was highly inflexible, they were hot, hard to take off and on, uncomfortable they often wore sores into the patient's skin they had to have them on essentially all of the time they had to be worn for a minimum generally speaking of 12 weeks oftentimes much longer than that there were some personal hygiene issues with wearing them the instrumentation the use of instrumentation in recent years has largely led to the elimination of these braces especially wearing them for long periods of time by patients that's good because what happened is the instrumentation kind of takes the place of stabilizing the bones during the fusion process that was previously done by the big braces so that's good from a patient's perspective what really needs to be asked is how do patients do how does the patient do with these metallic components inside of them? Is there some clear, consistent, repeated research that shows that patients do better with instrumentation in a fusion than without instrumentation in a fusion? Is there a clear advantage to instrumentation? Because what a patient wants to be is without pain or their pain reduced. What a patient wants is improved function. They want to be able to do more than they could before the surgery. So the question is, as far as function and pain goes, is there a clear advantage to instrumented fusion as opposed to non-instrumented fusion? Now, you might think intuitively, wait a minute, if instrumented fusion, if screws, rods, and plates improve the fusion, if that means that you have a better fusion, if the bones fuse together better, which again is after all we're trying to do to, during a fusion, trying to get the bones to fuse, and if instrumented fusion, if the research shows that instrumented fusion leads to better or higher rates of fusion with the use of instrumentation, then you would think that that would translate into improved patient satisfaction and better patient outcomes. So the question is, how do patients do with metallic components? Is there a clear advantage to using the hardware or metallic components? Well, let's take a look at what your spine is. Most of you may know already, 
It's made up of a stack of bones. They're all stacked up and down on top of each other, and in between them lies this thing called the disc that forms the primary portion of the joint in between each one of those spinal bones, at least for the front portion of the spine. What happens in a fusion is the doctor, the spinal surgeon, takes two of those bones, or three or four or five or six or seven or eight, or however many levels they're fusing, and they're asking those bones to become one. They're fusing them together. What previously was at least two bones now become, in the fusion, one. They're being fused together. They become one bone. The idea is that the pain is coming from the joint in between those bones. So if we eliminate that joint and stop motion, the pain will stop. The problem with that, the fundamental problem with that, I think expressed very well by a spinal surgeon in some literature that I read, he said the fundamental problem with a spinal fusion, with cause, causing two bones to become one, is that it does not restore the spine to its original manufacturer's specifications. What he's trying to say there is the spine is meant to move at each joint. And if you stop motion at one of the joints, the movement that was previously there needs to be made up for somewhere, and the spine does make it up. What happens is the joint above the fusion and the joint below the fusion has to pick up the slack, so to speak, and move more. This causes oftentimes, much more often than you'd like, something called adjacent segment disease, abbreviated ASD. That means the adjacent parts to the fusion, the part above and below it, the joint above and below, begin to go bad. They begin to deteriorate, which many times, much more than you might like, necessitates another surgery to fix the problem, the ASD or the adjacent segment disease that occurred above and below the fusion that was originally done. In other words, it's another surgery that's needed to fix a problem caused by the original fusion surgery. So what we see, what is seen in the literature, what's seen in research, is a much higher reoperation rate with instrumented fusion. From a patient's perspective, to answer the question, does a patient do better with instrumentation or without? From a patient's perspective. And a patient's perspective clearly is that they don't want another surgery. Metallic components don't do so well. Okay, at least according to that research, published in 2016 by the way, this is recent research. Okay. Now, that may be a little bit of a vague statement. You see a much higher reoperation rate with instrumented fusion. How much higher a rate of re-surgery, reoperation is needed with metallic component or instrumented fusion as opposed to non-instrumented fusion? Well, hold on to your hats for the answer to this one because there is research out there that indicates in one of the most groundbreaking studies regarding the high risk for patients undergoing instrumented fusion, in this particular study of 2015, a staggering, and indeed it is staggering, I'm using the, the words of the reviewer, the neurosurgeon's words that reviewed this study, a staggering 80% of the patients required additional surgery after the initial fusion for adjacent segment disease at five years after surgery. In other words, in this study, your chances of needing another surgery to fix what the original surgery caused due to adjacent segment disease, your chances of that are 80% in five years or less. I will guarantee you don't, you don't see too many copies of this study laying around the offices of spinal surgeons. That is staggeringly poor odds. Now you might think, gosh, <laughs> My gosh, uh, spinal fusion, why, for what? How could this surgery have been invented in the first place? Well, it was invented in the first place because spinal fusions do help people. For instance, spinal fusions, instrumented spinal fusions, have been shown to be effective 
with these conditions in particular. Other conditions also, but most notably these. First of all, scoliosis. For severe scoliosis, that's a, a sideways, a severe sideways curve of the spine. When it gets bad enough in people, to the point it can get to where it impairs on the function of their heart and lungs, then yes, spinal fusion has been shown to be effective. For, for spondylolisthesis, this is a condition where one vertebra becomes two, it kind of breaks in half. This is usually a condition that's there from the start, from birth, and it progresses. Oftentimes it gets no worse after your teen years, but if it does get worse, if it progresses, yes, spinal fusion has been shown to be effective for spondylolisthesis. Severe trauma, a real tragedy occurs. Somebody falls off a roof, is hit by a truck, a high velocity type of injury, multiple fractures, the patient is clinging to life, so many fractures or trauma to their spine that it's just, their condition becomes incompatible with life. Spinal fusion can indeed be effective and life-saving for these people. <clears throat> Tumors of the spine and infection of the spine, spinal fusion, including instrumented spinal fusion, can be very effective for those people. The problem with these conditions, all of these, is that these conditions are relatively speaking rare. There just aren't that many of them compared to, for instance, degenerative conditions or disc related conditions. And there are all kinds of those out there. I mean, they are all over the place. And if you can, make spinal fusion surgery appropriate for those conditions. If you can make people with that, those kinds of diagnoses, degenerative conditions and disc conditions, if you can make those candidates for spinal fusion, especially in instrumented spinal fusion, why then you open up a whole lot bigger pool of potential patients on whom you can perform spinal fusion. I mentioned spondylolisthesis. This is a condition where the vertebrae, usually many times present since birth, separates into two. Oftentimes, as you go into your teens or after puberty, it stabilizes, it never gets any worse, it doesn't give you any problems. But it can. If it can get worse, and if it does, spinal fusion, instrumented spinal fusion, has been shown to be effective. But as I said, a fusion can be done with or without the instrumentation without those costly high profit metallic implants. It can be done with or without them. When you have spondylolisthesis, spinal fusion has been shown to be an effective surgery for it. So I think it's fair to compare fusion with instrumentation to fusion without instrumentation for someone with spondylolisthesis. Let's see how they do. Spinal fusion has been shown to be effective for spondylolisthesis. Who does better? People who have the spinal fusion with instrumentation, with hardware, or the people who have spinal fusion without the hardware? And what the research shows that I found is this recent study, 2016, non-instrumented and instrumented fusions for spondylolisthesis yielded comparable, about the same results. So in a condition, even where it has been shown that spinal fusion is helpful, even then, at least by this study, it seems to make no difference whether it's done instrumented or not. And that's a critical point because the reoperation rate for instrumented fusion, as you recall, is higher. Why then would someone perform the instrumented fusion? if the results of instrumented and non-instrumented fusion are comparable. Why? I can think of one reason why. And I've said that the rate of spinal surgeries, instrumented spinal fusion surgeries, has been explosive, and indeed it has. I think this particular chart says it all. This is the rate of spinal fusions performed just in the state of Florida. All you really need to see is the curve that I'm about to draw here in just a minute. 
You start in the early 90s with about a thousand spinal fusions being performed in the state of Florida per year. Then, in the mid to late 90s, when heavy marketing by the manufacturers of the instrumentation began to spinal surgeons, you start to see a spike, an incredible spike upward, and it keeps going upward at what is essentially an exponential rate to where in 2012, almost 16,000 spinal sur surgeries, spinal fusions, most of them instrumented, are done. We go from about 1,000 to nearly 16,000. That is a skyrocketing rate. It's an almost unbelievable rate of increase. Why, why, why? Why a curve like this? Why an almost unbelievably high increase in the rate of spinal fusion surgeries? Why, why, why? Why so many spinal fusions? Well, the answer is provided to us, or at least they're attempting to, by a, a big article, a big uh, expose research type of article that was published in the Washington Post. They explain the why, or at least they try to. The decompression surgery. That's a lower octane type of surgery, less risky surgery. On that, that might yield a surgeon approximately $1,000. That's about what they make their fee on that, while a complex fusion would garner the physician as much as $6,000. Their answer to the why is right here. Why so many more fusions are being done. The decompression or laminectomy, as it's called, gains them about $1,000. That's their fee for that. It is less complex. It is less risky. There is less blood loss. There's less of a chance of things going wrong with the decompression. There's much less chance of another surgery being needed. And in many studies, and I'll show you those here in just a little bit, the decompression laminectomy has been shown to be just as effective as a fusion. But the decompression laminectomy gains the surgeon about $1,000 and the a complex fusion, their fee for that can be nearly $6,000. Now if you do the math on that, it's pretty easy to see a why from a financial point of view. There was a spinal surgeon near my hometown in Daytona Beach, Florida. A large article in the local paper at the time, a series of articles there was a lawsuit involved and a whistleblower type lawsuit in a hospital. This particular spinal surgeon was performing lots and lots of fusions. According to the article, he was performing three and four times the volume of the average spinal surgeon. Lots of fusions being done. And let's just make the numbers easy. He's doing 10 surgeries a week. Is there a motivation there? If you're doing 10 spinal surgeries a week, would you rather make $1,000 on each one of those surgeries or would you rather make $6,000? Here's the why. So many fusions are being done provided by the Washington Post article of 2013. I think uh, this physician puts it best in an article that I read. This doctor, he's not a spinal surgeon, but he says, look, this past decade has seen an unprecedented explosion in spine fusions. This trend has been driven by money, by the high rates of insurance reimbursement for fusions. In other words, what he appears to be saying and implying in a not-so-subtle manner, the rates of fusions have exploded not because they're medically necessary, but because it pays more, a lot more. The Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, a very prestigious medical journal, published recently an interview, partial interview, with an orthopedic surgeon, uh, a well-known orthopedic surgeon because he's a real pioneer in the area of providing non-surgical treatments for orthopedic position, orthopedic conditions. Uh, this is an orthopedic surgeon, but he recommends and was really a pioneer in the area of doing research on non-surgical treatment for orthopedic conditions, especially fractures. And they cite this orthopedic surgeon in this article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. They interview him and he speaks about a discussion that he recently had with a spinal surgeon colleague. 
And this spinal surgeon colleague says to him something revealing. The spinal surgeon says to another orthopedic surgeon that both fusion and laminectomy, fusion is the high paying surgery, laminectomy, that's the lower paying surgery, have roles in treating disc disease. In other words, spinal problems. They're both, they both have roles. But he goes on to say, I now fuse them all. Because the reimbursement for laminectomies, the lower paying surgery, has plummeted. And indeed, he's, he's correct. Insurance companies have reduced their reimbursement for the lower paying laminectomy or decompressions. The fusions pay more. Now, you have to admire the spinal surgeon's candor and, I suppose, honesty. Apparently, what he's saying, I will fuse the patient, whether the patient needs it or not. Even though the patient may be just as well served with a lower level decompression laminectomy, I still fuse them all, he appears to be saying, simply because the fusion pays more, a lot more. You have to admire his honesty. You also have to wonder how many other spinal surgeons share this spinal surgeon's sentiment and are acting on it. What's disturbing about one of the things that's disturbing about this increase, this dramatic increase in instrumented, particularly instrumented spinal fusions, is that much of the increase has been done on patients with a diagnosis of degenerative disc disease or DDD. Degenerative disc disease is shown here in this x-ray. I think you maybe you can see the lower portion, that gap there in between the two bones that the white arrow is pointing to. It's very narrowed down, the gap between the bones. The way that it should be is shown in that upper segment there where the, the other arrow, the black arrow that you may be able to see is pointing to. There, the bones are the correct space apart. Lower portion, bones are too close together. The disc space there has degenerated. That's degenerative disc disease. Now, degenerative disc disease looks dramatic on x-rays, but it is, it's a poor term because it's not really a disease in the sense that an infection or a cancer growing in your body. Degenerative disc disease is age-related, generally speaking. It's, it's normal degenerative changes that occur in your spine. It's very common. After all, we're all aging. So this is a condition that all of us will eventually face and go through because it often stabilizes and gets no worse. Many people with advanced degenerative disc disease have no pain. They go through degenerative changes with minimal to any pain and any orthopedic neurosurgeon will tell you if they have any experience at all, they will tell you that they've had patients with diagnosis of degenerative disc disease. And on follow-up x-ray, the degenerative disc disease appears to be progressing, getting worse, but the patient's symptoms don't change, or they even get better. And they've seen a lot of pain in patients who have no degenerative disc disease. And it bears repeating. Patients, many patients with degenerative disc disease that can be seen on x-ray and MRI have minimal, if any, symptoms at all. And yes, if you stay reasonably active, do some exercise, you can go through degenerative disc changes, which again, most of the time eventually stabilize with minimal to any symptoms whatsoever. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that disc is squished down. It just doesn't look right to me. Maybe somebody can do a surgery and increase that disc space, get it back to where it was. Why not do that surgery? Well, the reason that it's, as I said, disturbing that a lot of this surgery is being done on degenerative disc disease is because, as I said, much of the increase is due to this. The reason that it's disturbing is because in the best studies, randomized trials, they suggest that there's little, if any, advantage of diffusion for degenerative disc disease over well, <coughs> well, well, well structured rehabilitation. In other words, doing no surgery at all. For degenerative disc disease, there are several randomized trials. These are the best research that we have, the best kind of research, which shows 
that from fusion surgery with degenerative disc disease, you get no better than if you do no surgery. Fusion surgery, which is a classic example, especially instrument fusion, a classic example of major surgery with all of the attendant risks that any major surgery has. The research shows that there is, in many cases, relatively high complication rates with fusion surgery on the order of 10 to 33 percent, with the higher ranges being therefore instrumented fusion. And the research shows that for this condition, oftentimes, you get no better results from instrumented fusion with all of the attendant risks and possible complications than you do over not doing any surgery at all, just doing some exercise. Now, I mentioned complications. Wait a minute. That usually gets somebody's attention, especially somebody who maybe a spinal surgeon has recommended surgery for them. They say, wait a minute, complications from spinal surgery, from spinal fusions? Uh, they want to know, wait a minute, what kind of complications are there? Well, there are a whole host of them. Some of the more common are pseudoarthrosis. In a fusion, you're trying to get two bones to fuse. Pseudoarthrosis is just a term that means they don't fuse. For whatever reason, those bones just refuse to grow together to fuse, which is what you're trying to do in a fusion. That often leads to hardware failure. This is exactly what it sounds like. The plates, the rods, the screws become dislodged or break. Adjacent level disease, I've already touched on this. This is where the level above the fusion in your spine and the level in your spine below the fusion go bad, necessitating many times another surgery to fix the problem caused by the original surgery. Incidental durotomy. This is a condition where during surgery, remember, you're, the operation is being performed very, very close to your spinal cord. And incidental durotomy is where there's a tear in the protective strong outer covering which goes around your spinal cord. It gets a tear in it. This is a serious condition. It needs to be fixed immediately. Infection is always a problem with any surgery, especially spinal surgery. Sexual and urinary dysfunction, I don't think I need to go into details on that. Uh, that's exactly what it sounds like. Motor control losses do occur. That's where you have paralysis or partial paralysis of the muscles in your leg, usually muscles below the knee. Yes, a brace can be worn to assist this. <clears throat> so which surgeries have the highest rates of these complications, you might ask yourself quite naturally. And the answer is instrumented spinal fusions. If you look at hospital more morbidity rates, hospital data, what you see, unfortunately, is the complications of fusion surgery appear to be increasing, not going down over time. Additionally, what we're seeing is high and increasing rates of revision surgery for spine surgery in general across the board. A revision surgery is a surgery where the surgery needs to be done over again because the first surgery didn't work out. Those cases are increasing, not going down. Let's take a look at this diagnosis. Spinal stenosis, a very common diagnosis. Spinal stenosis is where the tunnel that your spinal cord sits in is beginning to become narrowed down. Or the holes in the side of your spine where the spinal nerves come out, those holes are starting to close down. This is a very common diagnosis, especially in folks past retirement age. It's becoming the single most common reason, the single most common diagnosis for spine surgery in patients over the age of 65. You're over 65. If you have a diagnosis of spinal stenosis and you have back pain, the standard of care now, according to this research, is instrumentation instrumented fusion. That's the standard of care. In other words, it's common to perform instrumented fusion for certain types of spinal stenosis if you're over the age of 65. So let's compare. If it's commonly done for patients over the age of 65 with back pain and spinal stenosis as a diagnosis, let's compare instrumented fusion, screws, rods, 
compared to non-instrumented fusion for the condition of spinal stenosis. Let's take a look at a group of people who have spinal stenosis. How do they do if they're treated with instrumented fusion compared to people who have a fusion without instrumentation? What the research shows is that patients undergoing non-instrumented fusion, that's without metallic components, exhibited better relief of low back pain at 6 and 24 post-operative months when compared with the instrument. And once again, the patient, from the patient's perspective, which ultimately is the only perspective that counts, pain reduction without instrumentation in a fusion is better. Now, obviously, if in a surgery a patient's pain is not reduced, then that's not a successful surgery, certainly not from the patient's perspective. In fact, there's a name for it. It's called failed back surgery syndrome. Once again, when you look at the patient from the patient's point of view, with regard to wanting to have less pain and more function, non-instrumented fusion does better. Now let's look at a different kind of surgery for spinal stenosis also, the same diagnosis. What if you have spinal stenosis, and that's what this research looked at, and you have it treated with instrumented fusion using the hardware and a fusion, or a different kind of surgery that involves no fusion. Not an instrumented fusion, not a non-instrumented fusion, but a decompression or a laminectomy is done. Who does better? Now, I like this particular study because it involved so many patients. 5,390 patients were involved. At two years after surgery, there was no significant difference in patient satisfaction for any of the outcome measures, no matter how you care to slice it, no matter how you compare those two groups, the ones who had fusion with instrumentation for spinal stenosis or the ones who had surgery without instrumentation, a lower grade surgery, less risky surgery, no matter what metric you care to measure them on or compare them by, there was no significant difference in patient outcomes in this large group of patients. Again, I like this study because it had so many patients in it. 5,390 patients. Fusion was not associated with any improved outcome. So no difference in outcome when performing the lower risk surgery as compared to the fusion with instrumentation. Let's take a look at another group of people. Same diagnosis spinal stenosis, and compare it, not as we did previously, a risky surgery compared to a lower risk surgery, but a risky surgery, more risky surgery, I should say, compared to no surgery of any kind. Let's assume you have spinal stenosis, and some of the people, in order to treat it, are treated with fusion with instrumentation, instrumented fusion, and another portion of those people are treated with no surgery of any kind. Now, because they received no surgery of any kind, that does not mean that nothing was done, that they had no treatment. It wasn't recorded what they had in treatment. We just know they didn't have surgery. Maybe they had physical therapy. Maybe they did some exercise. Maybe they just took it easy. Maybe they just let water run on their back in the shower for 20 minutes a couple of times a day. Maybe they got some other forms of heat, ultrasound, electrical stimulation. Maybe they decided to get in shape or lose weight. Maybe they used Pilates or yoga. Who knows? We just know they didn't have surgery. Who does better? If you have spinal stenosis, and some of the people have surgery with instrumentation and some have no surgery. Who does better? The overall results showed no statistical difference in outcome between the two groups. In other words, you end up just as well without surgery as with it. There seems to me to be a pattern emerging here as far as spinal stenosis goes. If you compare fusion with hardware compared to fusion without hardware, the studies that I've seen, as I've shown you, shows that fusion without hardware does better. If for spinal stenosis you compare fusion, instrumented fusion, hardware fusion with no fusion surgery, a lower octane surgery, a lower risk surgery, they do about the same. If you compare, again, patients with spinal stenosis, as is shown here, instrumented fusion 
to no surgery of any kind, they do about the same. I think that speaks for itself. Now, one aspect of spinal stenosis that is bothersome to me is that many physicians, many spinal surgeons, believe this to be a condition that just gets worse and worse and worse. It's characterized by progressive worsening and only the intervention of surgery can prevent the inevitable downward spiral in symptoms that you'll see with this. But the research simply doesn't show it. I say research, the research that shows, despite the belief this is a condition of progressive worsening spinal stenosis, the course of spinal stenosis in untreated and conservatively treated patients, in other words, patients who are treated just with maybe some medication, a little bit of exercise, physical therapy, can be favorable. The outcome can be favorable. Just mild exercise instead of surgery. And a good percentage of these folks that are oftentimes of retirement age can see a reduction or elimination in pain. Okay, let's take a look at another diagnosis here. One more. The elderly with a diagnosis of spinal instability. And the research here compared, again, fusion done with metallic implants, hardware, instrumented fusion, compared to fusion without instrumentation. But a different diagnosis here, spinal instability in the elderly. The results of that study show the results do not indicate any benefit in outcome from added instrumentation. In other words, for the diagnosis of spinal instability, you do no better with a fusion with instrumentation as a fusion without instrumentation. From a patient care perspective, the instrumentation gives the patient no advantage in outcome. This is vital, again, as I've mentioned, because we know that instrumentation with a fusion increases the risk of several complications. But if the results are the same, why would you subject yourself, why would a spinal surgeon, why would anyone subject you to the instrumented fusion with all of the attendant risks and possible complications when it doesn't provide any benefit? The research shows. Okay, how about total disc replacement? When this came out years ago, total disc replacement, replacement or the artificial disc was touted as kind of the replacement for fusion surgeries because there were many spinal surgeons who knew very well that there were a lot of problems, to say the least, with fusion surgery. So total disc replacement, that was touted as, hey, we have something new now. How do they compare though? How do artificial discs or total disc replacement compare to instrumented fusions? In the original FDA research done on this, both had only about a 50% success rate. That is a very low success rate for any kind of surgery in any context. Uh, maybe not emergency surgery, but certainly for elective surgery, that is not a good rate. Now, if you are an eternal optimist, then you might say to yourself conceivably, well, I've got a 50-50 shot with either one of these. That's better odds than I get in Vegas. I'll go for it. But a 50% success rate for what is essentially an elective surgery in that context, or really almost any other context, is an astonishingly low rate of success. Okay, what about hospitals? Are they concerned about the explosive growth rate in spinal fusion surgery? Well, let me just say this about hospitals. Over my career, they have changed dramatically. Boy, have they gotten prettier. Hospitals, when you drove by a hospital, you looked over there and there was no question in your mind, even without the sign out front, that that was a hospital. But today, boy, do they look nicer. They're gorgeous looking buildings, much prettier. This is marketing, of course. You drive by a hospital today, a new modern hospital, and you almost want to say, gosh, I don't know what that building is, but I'd like to, I'd like to stop in there. This is marketing. And nothing wrong with that intrinsically, but for somebody who knows something about commercial construction, 
it's a lot more expensive, this kind of construction, and hospital administrators are there as part of their duties to look out for the bottom line. And they need to do that. They need to look out for the income, and the hospital architecture now is much more expensive to support. Hospitals aren't overly concerned about the increase, the dramatic increase in spinal surgery because fusion surgery is more financially rewarding for hospitals as well as for surgeons. Surgeons are not the only ones making money on this. Far from it. In fact, hospitals collect two to four times as much from a fusion as the lower risk and oftentimes shown to be just as well served for the patient decompression laminectomy surgery. They collect four, two to four times as much from the fusions. Hospital administrators have no financial incentive to be concerned about the increase in fusions. Fusion surgery is, uh, it's, it just, it makes money for almost everyone involved. What do surgeons say? How do surgeons explain? What is their answer? How do they respond to questions about the dramatic increase in the use of spinal fusion, especially instrumented spinal fusion surgery? Well, most of them just simply don't want to discuss it. They just refuse to talk about it. Now, to their credit, uh, I do see more in the literature, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, about uh, things said at conferences, maybe letters to the editor, editorials written by spinal surgeons, they generally fall into the category of uh, spinal surgeons, we need to restrain ourselves, but this has been ineffective for two decades. In fact, you can make an argument that things have gotten worse, much worse. It, spinal surgeons, uh, concerning the amounts of money received, from implant manufacturers and their salespeople, uh, they just make the argument that these things, either they make the argument that, that it simply doesn't incentivize them to do more surgery, or they say that there needs to be collaboration between consulting between the spinal surgeon and the manufacturers of the devices, because that's the way that the industry moves forward technologically. There's a difference here, though, in a spinal surgeon consulting with a manufacturer of a device. That device manufacturer is not really selling to the surgeon in the sense that the surgeon is paying for it. Here it's different because somebody else is paying. That's me and you, that's the insurance company, that's Medicare. So it completely blows the argument out of the water, in my opinion, that it's essential that spinal surgeons collaborate with industry. Concerning spinal surgeons' answer to the skyrocketing use of instrumented spinal surgery, just the sheer numbers being done, their explanations for this tend to fall into two different categories. The first is the technology explanation. Uh, they kind of say, you know, look, uh, there's less blood loss during surgery in general. In general, there's less time under anesthesia. And the technology with regard to surgeries has improved. Uh, computer navigation allows uh, spinal surgeons to place the instrumentation, the screws and the rods, more precisely and more easily. You can operate more safely on older patients that have more comorbidities, other things wrong with them that you couldn't put under general anesthesia previously. So due to all these reasons, we're seeing an increase in spinal fusion surgery. <clears throat> but because something can be done more easily, so to speak, does not necessarily mean that it needs to be done more commonly or that it's helpful or healthful for the patient to have more of it. There's so many examples of this. It, 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 it just seems obvious to me that the easier to fuse people now than in the past uh, explanation just doesn't carry any water. The other explanation is what I call the demographic explanation. This is the explanation that, well, what we're seeing more of is 
uh, fusions in the elderly population, pe people of uh, retirement age, and indeed that's true, and they say, hey look, baby boomers are retiring, we're seeing a much higher proportion, much higher percent of the population is uh, in the retirement age, and that's why we're seeing this dramatic increase in the use of spinal fusion surgery. And they also say many of these folks, uh, they want to be more active in their retirement years now. And they want to enter their retirement years in a more active manner. So they're choosing spinal fusions in order to decrease pain and be more active. Now, that would be true if research consistently and repeatedly showed that with instrumented spinal fusion, which is the one that's going up at the highest rate with fusions, that you saw an improvement in function consistently and you saw decreases in pain compared to lower octane surgeries or compared to, quite frankly, doing no surgery at all. And that research, I'm not aware of it. Additionally, if the reason that we're seeing so much of an increase in spinal fusions, especially in the retirement age folks, if that was because we have more retirement age people, then you would also see other surgical procedures that are done primarily on the elderly also increasing and at the rate that spinal surgery is increasing and you just don't see that. Now, concerning um, retirement age people, choosing spinal fusions, consenting to it, more of them, requesting it, as spinal surgeons say, uh, that may be, I would say, or I would certainly ask the question concerning that issue, are these people that are requesting it, consenting to it, doing so in a truly informed consent manner? Are they aware of all of the complications? Are they aware of the results, the outcomes with especially instrumented spinal fusion? Are they aware of the resurgery rates with instrumented spinal fusion? And are they aware of how you do with spinal fusion surgery compared to other surgeries or again compared to no surgery at all? Are they aware of all of that? And I am sure that on paper it shows that they are aware that the informed consent was obtained, but that's not the same. In other words, just showing that all of the boxes have been checked is not the same as true informed consent. And of course there's one more answer that spinal surgeons if you can call it an answer to the dramatic increase in the use of instrumented spinal fusion, and that is that they simply deny. They deny that the financial incentives, which they acknowledge are there, they just deny that it incentivizes them to perform more instrumented spinal fusions. They deny it, they just say, the money doesn't influence me. And a famous researcher, a very esteemed researcher, wrote something on this, uh, in a prestigious journal recently, he said, the truth is that we are all economically rational. And I take that simply to mean that no matter how emotional we can all be at times, how irrationally emotional we can get, oftentimes to our detriment, when it comes to money, we all do what is in our own best interest. We suddenly become very rational or economically rational. That's human nature and it's alive and well as I said in all of us. Spinal surgeons are no different. Okay, what about physical therapists? I do not want anyone to get the impression that this physical therapist believes that all of us physical therapists are as pure as the driven snow. What about my profession? Why don't Physical therapists speak out about this. Well, my professional association to some degree has, but in reality, in, in, in what happens in reality, what I've seen is that in outpatient settings where physical therapists are employed in hospitals or in the hospital themselves, um, it would be, they, they know that it would be very unwise for them to speak out about the high rates of spinal fusions because in those hospitals and hospital outpatient departments, 
a large majority of the referrals that they receive are from orthopedic and neurosurgeons, sometimes the biggest share of them. In a physical therapy clinic, if you work in a physical therapy clinic as a physical therapist, one that's owned by a spinal surgeon, you are not going to jeopardize your job by speaking out about this. If you work in a private practice, the owner of that private practice often garners and grooms relationships with orthopedic surgeons, spinal surgeons, neurosurgeons, and the owner of that clinic is not going to look kindly on you jeopardizing, possibly jeopardizing the relationships that he or she, the owner of the clinic, has worked on for years. Those referral relationships from, many times, spinal surgeons. Physical therapists make money on this too. And let me give you a little example of us physical therapists. We bill using five-digit billing codes. This is the way billing used to be done. It's changed quite a bit in the last few years, but years ago, and still now, we use five-digit billing codes. The most commonly used code, there were only a handful of them, that physical therapists used was 97110 Therapeutic Exercise. That was the code most commonly used by physical therapists. We had others, we used others, but this was the most commonly used. A few years back, quite a few years back. Another code that physical therapists used, they used it not very commonly, but it was a code that physical therapists used for billing. That code was mistakenly reimbursed at a much higher rate. It was a mistake made by Medicare. They accidentally paid a lot more for this not so commonly used code. And of course, Medicare and its infinitely efficient manner, took about four months to correct their mistake, to stop reimbursing so high for this. During that four month period of time, does anybody care to guess what then became the most commonly used billing code by physical therapists? Yes, we are all economically rational, as the esteemed physician researcher said. Okay, what do I offer as a solution here? Answers. Well, I have suggestions. I, I can't say that I have a conclusive, all-curing answer for this, but I have suggestions that I think would definitely go a long ways with regard to resolving some issues here. Number one, require full disclosure. Medicare, Medicaid, government-sponsored insurance programs, the VA, uh, workers' compensation can require of them that they fully disclose to patients where they receive their income from. If it's all from patient care, just put 100% for patient care. If a lot of it or certain percentages of it is from industry, you need to disclose the percentage. This would be easy to know, do now with computer applications or programs. It would be easy to do and require that if they want to participate in government-sponsored insurance programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, VA, workers' compensation, require that they fully disclose what percentage of their income comes from where. You could break it down into four or five basic categories. And then let the public decide if they want to get their care from you based on that information. If you don't, as a provider, a physical therapist, doctor, whatever the case may be, if you don't want to disclose that from the public, then you do not get to participate in government-sponsored insurance programs. Get your patients from private insurance or charge cash and then take whatever the traffic will bear. Number two, education. Education is truly the key. In a free society, where by definition that freedom gives us lots of choices, wonderful choices from which we can choose to obtain our health care needs from. That's the definition of a free society. We get lots of choices. But a free society requires more of its people, not less, with regard to educating ourselves concerning those choices. Some of the choices are good quality, some of them are not so good at quality. We all need to take the responsibility to educate ourselves concerning the choices that are available. We need to take more of a responsible responsibility with regard to that. If you don't want the responsibility, the burden, or quite frankly, the privilege of educating yourself in a free society, then you haven't paid the price for all of the choices that could be available to you. Somebody will make that choice for you. Education is truly the key. And hopefully, 
This video has, in a small way, contributed to that education. Feel free to contact me with comments or questions at my contact information listed below. This is Peter Gusky with the Back Saver System. <laughs>